الشخص الذي سيحدثنا لاحقا هو الشريك المؤسس لاحدى اكبر الشركات في العالم في مجال العافيه وسوف يشاركنا جميعا بقصه وصوله الى ما هو عليه اليوم وما يمكننا ان نتعلم من مسيرته سيداتي وسادتي برجاء الترحيب بالرئيس التنفيذي والشريك المؤسس لتطبيق كاوم العالمي الشهير مايكل اكتون سميث and Michael Ahlan Wasahlan Vic. The man you're going to hear from next is the co-founder of one of the world's biggest companies in the wellness space. And he will be sharing with us how he got to where he is today and what the rest of us can learn from his own journey in entrepreneurship. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the co-founder and co-CEO of the globally renowned Calm App. Michael Acton Smith. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. So uh, wonderful to be here. I think we've got a video, a very short video to play at the, the start of my talk. 50 years ago, jogging and yoga and aerobics wasn't really a thing. And then doctors and celebrities came out and talked about it. And brands have been built off the back of that huge boom. The big societal shift that's taking place is towards the idea of taking care of the mind being as important as taking care of the body. Our mission is pretty simple. We want to make the world a happier and healthier place. We believe this can be one of the iconic brands of the 21st century, one of the most meaningful and valuable brands in, in the world. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm Michael, and uh, great to be here. Great to be at an entrepreneur's event. There's nothing quite like building uh, a startup. Um, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the sleepless nights, the headaches, the challenges, but also the exhilaration and the rewards and the energy and the excitement of working with uh, an incredible team. And uh, I really think it is one of life's great adventures. And, and today I briefly want to talk about the calm story. A uh, bit of a roller coaster. It was definitely uncalm um, over the last few years that we've been building this company. And I want to share a few of the lessons that we, we learned along the way. So it all started about a decade ago, 2011, in London, in Soho. I was sitting on my sofa in my house with my good buddy, Alex Chu. We were playing video games. And uh, Alex said he's got an amazing domain name that he'd heard was available to buy. And uh, I said, what is it? He said, calm.com. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow. We paused the game <laughs> and we started talking about it and felt the world was becoming more stressful. Could we build an incredible brand helping people reduce their anxiety, uh, and just bring a little more calm into the world. And I asked how much the domain name was going for, and he said a million pounds. So I pressed uh, unpause on the video game, and we carried on playing, and that was completely out of our reach. We were broke uh, entrepreneurs back then. But about a year later, we'd still been thinking about the idea and, and couldn't get it out of our heads, and we were playing another video game, and Alex said, the guy who had that domain wants to sell it. He's looking to do a deal. And so we got creative, and we went to him and said, uh, could we buy the domain for 5% of this amazing business we're going to build? <laughs> and uh, he, he laughed at us and said, no, <laughs> of course not. That would be worth about $100 million now. But um, he instead uh, took about £100,000. So we got the domain. That was a, a huge amount of money for us. Um, <laughs> we just felt there was a, a massive opportunity here. We felt we could potentially build the Nike of the mind, maybe one of the most valuable and, and meaningful brands in the world. So 
that was the starting point. And the lesson there was the importance of a good brand name, something that's memorable and simple and, uh, and easy to, to type online. So we felt that it would be great to test this idea a little bit. And uh, Alex put together a website called donothingfortwominutes.com. Not quite as catchy as calm.com, but we wanted to use it as a test. And uh, the whole idea was that it's very hard for people to sit still and, and do nothing. And people couldn't do it. Uh, they couldn't sit there and just sit two minutes without touching their keyboard or their mouse. And bizarrely, it went viral. Uh, we asked people to enter their email address at the end of it. And we got about 100,000 email addresses. We got some PR. And that formed our seed list to, to help launch the, the full business. And so the really valuable lesson we learned there was how important it is to create an MVP, to take baby steps, uh, a small bet to test into your idea. So that gave us the confidence to, to get going. And we decided to create a meditation app. Uh, the first version of Calm was, was very rough and ready. But we felt meditation was this amazing skill that had been around for thousands of years. But no one had really made it simple or accessible or relatable. And so that was our starting point. And uh, it was very slow at, at the beginning. But we felt you know, this could be a chance to help people train their minds just like we've been training our bodies. Could we help make mental fitness as important as physical fitness? And there was so much skepticism back then. Often when starting a new idea, you'll get a lot of pushback. And that's usually a, a sign that you're, you're onto something. Um, so people would back away from us at parties when we told them we were building a, a meditation app. But little by little, the word of mouth started to spread, and the business grew. And uh, we had a bit of traction, but we had no money to promote uh, Calm. And uh, we tried to raise finance in Silicon Valley and, and struck out. We spoke to about 100 investors. We tried to get into YC and, and failed there. And eventually, after a lot of work, um, we raised a small seed round of about $500,000. So that got us going. But the lesson there was just how important it is to have that irrational optimism, that sense of belief that what you're doing is going to change the world, even if everyone else thinks you're crazy, to plow onwards no matter how many uh, obstacles you hit. So one of the things that really helped Calm kind of take off was creating the Daily Calm with our incredible teacher, Tamara Levitt. It helped people build a habit around meditation. They came back day after day after day, which is so important for any type of digital product or any product, uh, creating loyal users. And we were charging about $10 a month at this stage. And we were running out of cash. Sorry, not $10 a month, $10 a year, which um, uh, was not generating a lot of revenue for us. And we were fast running out of our, our seed cash that we'd raised. And we decided to try something. We, we tested increasing the price fourfold to $40. We were very nervous of what would happen. But incredibly, we didn't see any drop off. Uh, we increased our revenues fourfold. And the amazing thing that happened was that we became profitable. We had a very small, nimble, lean team. We kept costs to the, the bone. And we were now profitable. And so we didn't need to raise more money if we didn't need to. Such an important lesson. Our future was in our control and destiny. So that was a, a key turning point. And it was a, a good job we were profitable, because we tried to raise a Series A for years and <laughs> kept striking out. Um, we kept being told meditation and mindfulness was a fad. Uh, it was just too niche. No one would be able to build a, a big enough audience in that space. But around this time, we had a, a breakthrough. And we were looking at our data, and we noticed a spike Every evening at about 11 PM, all around the world, this was consistent, this strange spike in, in usage. And we realized what was happening is that people were listening to our meditations to help them drift off to sleep. They loved Tamara's voice so much. Uh, and we thought, whoa, that's not how you meditate. That's all wrong. <laughs> um, but of course, like good entrepreneurs, we, uh, we saw there was uh, a use case in our product that we didn't foresee. And that helped us build sleep stories. We thought, what if we could create stories that mixed music and soothing voices and sound effects and could help people drift off to, to sleep every night? And uh, they solved a, a big problem. So many people were suffering from insomnia. And they were a massive hit. Instead of a, 
a traditional story being an arc. These were more like a slope. They start interesting, and then they get more soporific until you fall asleep and, and don't know what happens at the end. And the great thing about sleep, this was another lesson, go after big markets. 7.8 billion people around the world go to sleep every single night of their life. So that's uh, a pretty, pretty awesome TAM uh, to go after. And then we sprinkled in a few extra elements. One of the secret sources to Calm's growth in the early days was PR. Um, this is a really important lesson. Um, find ways to get the, the press to, to write about your product in unusual, quirky ways. And so when GDPR legislation came out, we decided to turn that into a sleep story. And we had uh, tons of, of press written about it. We made a movie that was eight, hour long, eight hours long called Bar Bar Land about sheep grazing in a field that uh, got us lots of PR. And then we sprinkled some celebrity stardust uh, on top of the sleep stories. We worked with Stephen Fry and Matthew McConaughey and Harry Styles. And uh, Harry's story got about 500 press articles on the day that it came out. So this all helped fuel the, the word of mouth um, behind Calm. And one of the other great things about working with celebrities, it was a, a really important lesson for us, was that they helped normalize the conversation around mental health. You know, it's easy to, to forget just a few years ago, there was so much stigma associated with mental health. Very few people wanted to, to talk about it. And the celebrities and Calm and, and other companies have helped turn mental health from being in the shadows and putting it into the light where it belongs, where we can all talk about it. So that was a, a really important turning point. Then another key lesson was waiting to do marketing until we'd got product market fit. So we definitely had product market fit now. The business was whirring along. We'd got to about 8 million downloads and hadn't spent anything on marketing. And we made uh, an amazing hire, a lady called Dunn in, in Silicon Valley, that helped with our Facebook advertising. This is about 2017. And uh, incredible, the, the team that she built, um, making sure our LTV was many multiples, our lifetime value, many multiples of our customer acquisition cost. And so that helped us pour gasoline on the fire that was already burning, and Calm continued to grow. And now, finally, we had uh, investors interested in, in chatting to us about a, a Series A. Our revenue went from 300000 dollars a year to $2 million a year, then to $7 million a year, then $20 million a year. And again, a lot of people think these companies are overnight successes, but so many bets, uh, so much grind, so much patience to, to get to that point. And while we were negotiating our Series A, uh, we were fortunate enough to win Apple's App of the, the Year, which definitely strengthened our hand and uh, made sure we, we got a, a good deal. And then we grew that year from 20 million revenue to 80 million, 4x in a year. And we were able to raise a, a round at a, a billion dollar valuation. Calm became the world's first mental health unicorn. And to show how the mental health space has grown so much over the last two years, there's now 26 mental health unicorns that have been crowned in, in the last couple of years. It's an extraordinary space, important and uh, successful commercially, but just as important, if not more, so valuable and, and helpful to, to millions of people around the world. So one lesson here was that you cannot rest on your laurels. When something is working, you constantly be looking at the next thing. And we saw business to business as a big opportunity, particularly during the pandemic. Could we sell Calm into companies that wanted to support the mental health of their workplace? And, and that's been a, a massive, fast-growing area. And helps tie back to our ultimate mission, which is to make the world happier and healthier and solve the global mental health crisis. So to, to wrap up before um, we have our, our interview on, on stage with Sonia, just three quick lessons to, to leave you with um, for all the entrepreneurs in the room. One is the importance of timing. Make sure you launch uh, into a space at, at the right moment. Don't leave it too late. Don't be way, way too early, but uh, get there at the, the right moment. And you've got to figure out where the puck is going, not where the puck is at, at the current moment. And connected to that, a lot of entrepreneurs gloss over this, but do the work, the hard work, the, the, the grind of the research and the investigation, knowledge is power when building a startup. There are so many smart people in the world who are trying to do something similar to you. You've got to go deep on whatever area you're exploring. And the final 
uh, bit of advice I'd say is have fun on the journey. You know, the, the journey is the reward, reward when building a startup. So I want to wish everyone in this room who's building a company good luck and uh, encourage you to dream big. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for sharing your story. It's definitely incredible and inspiring. But we're not going to let you go. We want to learn more about you, of course, and your incredible journey. And for that, we're going to welcome Sonia Weimler, founding partner of Venture Souk, who will be leading on a stage, interviewing, of course, with Michael, Sonia, and Michael. The stage is yours. شكرا يا مايكل على مشاركتك ولكن نرغب في معرفة المزيد عنك وعن مسيرتك وسنرحب بسونيا ويملر الشريك المؤسس لشركة فنتشر سوك والتي ستدير مقابلة على المسرح مع مايكل سونيا ومايكل المسرح لكما Good afternoon everyone I hope everyone's having a great day here at Ceph. Um, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, flying all over here. I know you've been uh, all over the world over the last uh, three or four days. Um, so we're going to talk about mental health. Um, front of mind, um, the pandemic definitely accelerated uh, the need for us to have this discussion at a deeper level. Um, at least from what I found, the entrepreneurs that I've spoken with, the entrepreneurs that are here today, are sometimes just confused. Is this something that I talk about? Should I not talk about? I'm fundraising at the same time. Will it go against me? So I think it's really important for all of us to have kind of this collective, honest discussion about, um, about mental health specifically. So um, I'd like to start, we talked a lot about Calm during your presentation. You did have a life before Calm. Yes. Um, and you built a few companies before Calm, some that went well, some that didn't go so well. So maybe if you could just share to start with um, a couple of lessons learned maybe from some of those previous companies that you built. Yes, so I um, hope everyone can hear me. All right, I'll switch to that if, if not. But uh, prior to Calm, I, I ran an a entertainment company and we created a, a world for kids called Moshi Monsters. It was like the sort of modern day version of um, Tamagotchi. Mm -hmm and uh, grew very rapidly. Um, and I think one of the, the, the lessons I learned there was not equating the number of employees I have with the success of the business. You know, so many entrepreneurs, you ask how they're doing, they say, oh, we're up to 100 people or whatever. And I learned that, that, that with Calm, what we tried to do was um, we were proud of having uh, a few employees. We were very efficient and very nimble. So that was one of the big lessons. The second one was just not being alert um, quick enough to a, a big platform change. So Moshi was built on, on Flash, on the web. And we saw mobile coming, but I don't think we, we got ahead of it uh, and understood it and went deep enough on it early enough. And we were too late by the time it had shifted. So we're consciously now very carefully looking at what's coming mm -hmm. uh, in the future to make sure we don't uh, get left behind for the next big shift. OK. And obviously, you're the founder of Calm. Um, when the pandemic hit, what did you um, establish kind of within your own organization amongst your employees in terms of practices maybe? Yes, I, I remember back in March 2020 when it hit, I think we were all incredibly confused and anxious and, and concerned. Uh, we, we ha I can remember having a Zoom call where we said, right, um, we're probably not gonna be able to hire anyone over, over Zoom, we'll batten down the hatches, we'll just stay uh, where we are. And, Pretty soon, we, we just got to a, a new normal. And one of the, the things that held our culture together, one of the things we are proudest about back in the office was the daily calm that we would do every morning. 10 minutes, the team would come in and connect, and, and uh, we'd start our day off in, in that very thoughtful way. And so we implemented that um, over Zoom, and people would join. And it was a really nice way of just having the team check in with each other every single morning. Uh, and then some folks on the team did an afternoon dance party and then quizzes and uh, all the usual stuff that we saw in the early days of the, the pandemic before everyone started getting uh, a lot of Zoom fatigue. The yeah. <laughs> There's one great practice that I read about um, that Michael, I think, came up with uh, called API. Um, and 
it literally is an acronym for Assume Positive Intent. And when I read about this, um, I actually started applying it. So for the people in the room, Michael's going to tell you about the API kind of methodology and I think it'll probably resonate. Do you want to maybe explain to us what it's about? Yeah, I wish, I wish it was my invention. It was uh, <laughs> Matt, Matt Mullenweg um, uh, from Automatic and WordPress, one of our investors. Uh, I heard him talking about it a while ago, but I just loved it. So it's obviously not the traditional API we all know from the tech world, but as you say, assume positive intent. And in an asynchronous world where we can't pick up on body language, where we're getting endless slacks and emails and text messages, um, it's so easy to misinterpret someone's message. People are firing off all sorts of messages that 99, 98% of the time, when you read something as negative, it usually isn't. It's just your brain <laughs> doing that. So always best to assume positive intent instead of firing back a, a snarky, passive-aggressive email, and it, it just keeps everything um, uh, in check. So that's been a, a, a valuable thing I've tried to bear in mind uh, during the last year and a half. Mm. So. Just keep that in mind next time you get a, an email that seems to be negatively tuned. It's actually probably not, and it's probably in your head. Um, so the other question I had was around the space. I mean, you alluded to the fact that it was actually not very easy for you to raise um, your Series A. And that was at a time where people, I mean, I guess people were meditating, but it was more siloed. Now it's become more mainstream. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you see the space evolving over the next five to 10 years? I mean, obviously, there's, we're at an inflection point now where it's kind of that hockey stick happening. Where, is this, where are we heading towards over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, it's pretty incredible how fast things have moved over the last few years. Um, again, we, we've gone from people looking at us uh, strangely at parties, as I mentioned, just not understanding what meditation or mindfulness is, to, to almost everybody seemingly embracing it. Not everyone does it, but I think everyone gets the, the value of it. The science and the academic research has increased dramatically uh, over the last few years. So in terms of your question of where, where it's heading, you know, I think the first wave was around consumer and Headspace and Calm and, and several other companies were, were creating a normalizing um, consumer use of, of apps, and that's still going to remain very popular. But I think a, a big growth area is, as I mentioned during my talk, B2B. Companies now offering mental health support to their workplace. Again, that's going to go from being a fringe, uh, unusual benefit uh, to table stakes. And it, it seems so obvious. You know, why shouldn't we look after the mental health of our teams um, to help them when they're struggling, but also to help them move from mental wellness to, to mental fitness, to improve resilience, to improve sleep, to improve creativity, EQ in, in the, the modern workplace. So I think that's a, a big growth area. And I just think health and wellness in, in general is, is growing dramatically. Psychedelics is a, a very interesting space. Could that hold the key to help crack the, the mental health crisis? Um, and, uh, and are you seeing a difference? Um, I know you've signed a few partnerships in the US, for example, with like Kaiser, et cetera, but I'm just curious to know like how that's different across the markets that you're in, in terms of these B2B partnerships that you're doing. Obviously, the US is very attuned to it, the Europe probably is. I'm not so sure this region necessarily is just yet, but are you seeing, were you surprised by some regions maybe where you're actually developing this B2B model um, versus others? Yes, yeah, so US has definitely led the way. I think uh, it's partially because of the way their health care system is structured and, and employees um, employee funded in, in many instances. Um, and we're seeing Europe start to, to catch up and, and more companies um, sort of normalize this. And one of the reasons I'm excited about uh, coming uh, here to the uh, to this region is to chat to companies and understand whether there are opportunities for us to partner and, and work with others because the stigma around mental health is, is different in, in different regions around the world, different cultural norms. But when you step back, we're all human beings wherever we live. We all have a mind. We all have a body. We all struggle uh, in different ways, even if we're not allowed to talk about it in the same way. So, you know, we're very hopeful that it, it will become completely destigmatized and, and completely normal to discuss everywhere. And do you have any plans of perhaps launching Calm in Arabic at any point? So I've had a few conversations this morning already. Uh, I know there are some great uh, competitors out here in the market. So, you know, we'd love to, to chat. There may be partnerships, but nothing, nothing in the, the short term. 
And uh, you and I discussed this, and I'm still going to bring it up because it's a question that I'm personally interested in. But as you look to scale to other markets with different languages, the apps are already available in, I think, Korean, Portuguese, Japanese, um, eventually Arabic. Um, how easy or difficult is it? Like, do you literally just transliterate the, the content, or do you look for those nuances, those kind of cultural and, and linguistic nuances? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So the first uh, way we tried to solve this was just launching the car map everywhere in English. And we got a bit of take up in different markets, but of course, local markets prefer to have their own language. So then we started translating uh, the current app into different markets, and, and we definitely saw an uptick then. But the key is to have people on the ground in, in those markets, officers who truly understand the nuances and the culture and can not just translate a story or a meditation, but find a local voice, a celebrity, a, a narrator, a meditation teacher to um, make it connect uh, deeply and authentically with the, the local audience. And you kind of started doing that with your partnership with Universal Music Group, right? Where you're kind of enlisting these, I guess, mainly English-speaking artists. So eventually, if you do want to come to this region, then you'll go look for um, our celebrities from this region um, and kind of speak to them about potentially taking the lead, right? Definitely, yeah. Who, who would you recommend we chat to? Uh, Sheikh Abadur, uh, Najla al Mitfa, probably, I would start with. Um, because they both are big fans of uh, meditation. So I think uh, that would be a great start, actually. Um, all right, last but not least, because we're running out of time, I do want to talk, because I'm an investor, so I have to kind of plug this in as well. You have some amazing investors. I mean, you have Mark Benioff, you have TPG, you have Lightspeed, uh, you have Goldman Sachs. I mean, you're at, what's your valuation now? Uh, Two billion was the last round. Two billion dollar valuation. I mean, considering you were struggling to raise for your <laughs> Series A, that's insane. Um, but being serious, I think people, and we tend to forget that we as investors are here for you, for the entrepreneurs. We are meant to act as stewards to you and to your journey. And so I think it would be beneficial for at least the entrepreneurs in the room and maybe the investors as well to listen in as to what is the value that you look forward to the most in your investors? Like how can we be of help to you as an entrepreneur in the best way possible? Yeah, so we, we've been blessed, as, as you mentioned, with great investors. They've been incredibly supportive uh, of us, and, and they were often the first to, to kind of get what we were doing, and so have been big champions uh, since the start. I think one of the, the, the best ways we work with investors is almost when they have a, a sixth sense. They understand when to lean in and when to offer support and advice and when to step away and just let, let us get on with it. And uh, as I say, the best investor relationships have that kind of um, uh, special sort of dance that, that, that we do. You definitely, you know, in earlier stages of my career, I've had investors that uh, want to be operators and they're kind of in, <laughs> in the weeds and driving everyone around the bend. Uh, and then at the other extreme, you have investors that write a check and you never hear from them again. Yeah. So striking that balance is, is not easy. And uh, how do you think about it? How do you work with the uh, Well, I guess I was going to ask you the next question, which is somewhat related, but, and we didn't discuss this so off the cuff now. Um, Presumably, you have some female investors on your cap table, right? Yes, uh, Nicole and Quinn from um, Lightspeed is, is on our board and a uh, fantastic investor. And so, you know, I guess one topic that comes about a lot in this region is that there are not, not enough female investors, etc. I'm curious to know from your perspective, given kind of all the various fundraising rounds that you've done, you've seen early stage investors to later stage investors. Have you felt like, and I don't want to sound controversial, but I'm still going to say this. Um, do you feel like maybe female investors tend to be more intuitive uh, types of investors, or do you not see a difference between her, for example, and, and I don't know, Mark? I think it's, yeah, it's hard to, to generalize, but I, I think there's some truth to that. And I think um, Nicole, for instance, uh, is a great investor in the health and wellness space and understands that, that deeply. So uh, yes, I think, uh, I think it would be fair to say um, uh, she is a little more intuitive than intuitive. yeah. Okay, well that's interesting. Um, I think we've actually run out of time, but thank you so much for sharing your journey uh, with Calm and building Calm and sharing these insights with us. Really appreciate it. and welcome to the region. Thank you. Delighted to be here and happy to chat to anyone afterwards. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.